So Christian Kohler um, was the head of building technologies department at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, just recently stepped down last month. Um, has spent for over 20 years, he has been involved in all aspects of building energy efficiency research, such as simulation, measurement, and technology development. He has been deeply engaged in software development for various Windows related tools such as Therm Window and Optics 5. He has also led the development of new technologies for highly insulating and dynamic windows. His activities include algorithm development, user support training, develop, developing embedded controllers and experimental work on highly insulating and dynamic windows. However, the interesting thing is today he is not here to talk to us so much about windows, but more so about his experience with heat pumps. So Christian, welcome. Thank you very much for taking your time to join us today. Thank you. I, I, I realized that we should have done a different introduction, Robert, but you did, you did catch it that what I'm talking about today is um, not so closely related to the work I've been doing um, at Berkeley Lab, but it is um, related in the bigger theme of decarbonization that we're talking about these days. So I'm gonna be talking about heat pump mini splits and some ideas I have about how we could be scaling up installs and speeding that up. So first I wanna just talk about um, level set, what we're talking about. We're talking about ductless mini split heat pumps. Um, this is mostly a residential product, could also be in small commercial buildings. Um, and what it will be is like an outdoor unit like this, and then a, uh, for example, a wall unit that's mounted. This is a single zone ductless mini split. We could also have something like this, that is one outdoor unit with three, um, two, three, four indoor units, what's called a multi-zone ductless mini split. What we are not talking about today is um, central AC or heat pump systems with, with ducts, as you see in this image. So we're not talking about this, but we are talking specifically about heat pumps. And um, as you know, an air conditioning unit and a heat pump, um, as you probably know, are very similar, except there's one device in there called a reversing valve that turns an air conditioning unit into a heat pump. And so there's a a school of thought out there that we shouldn't be installing air conditioning only units anymore. We should be installing heat pumps um, and that they even maybe should be outlawed to make an air conditioning only unit and have every unit have the capability to provide heating. So what we're talking today is, is a device that can cool or heat um, and is in this category. And the premise of what I want to talk about today is that I think we need specialists rather than generalists in the HVAC installer um, realm. So if you are a residential HVAC te technician today, you're a general generalist. You have to know um, a lot about various systems such as furnaces. Um, I moved recently to the East Coast and you know, I've seen oil furnaces, there's gas furnaces, of course, there's boilers that could be oil, gas, or electric, central AC units. There's a broad range of um, equipment that you have to know how to work with. And that's, that's very important, but that means it's a lot of training, a lot of time before you're proficient on all these systems as an installer. What I'm thinking uh, about is that we should quickly train technicians to install a very um, specific device, this, these ductless mini split heat pumps. And the reason is that it's um, a, a subset of the skills, so you can become better at it faster. You can do high quality installs. You can do cost effective installs because you exactly know what to work on, what tools to need, and you do them a lot. So it's the um, building up skills specifically for a subset of the equipment. And so I think if we um, have technicians that are ductless mini split heat pump installers, of course, if you're a firm and you have 30 technicians, you cannot have 30 technicians that are all HVAC, that are all mini split installers. But you might be able to have five or 10 that all they do is 
install these products. So that's my idea, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, what skills are needed and uh, to do that. So if one were to be a mini split specialist, you have certain skills that you need. Um, you need to physically mount the indoor and outdoor units. You need to run refrigerant lines, including making flares, such as in this picture here, and bending the, the tubing. You need to know how to pressure test, how to do evacuation. You need to know the EPA 608 certification um, material. You have to be trained for that to handle refrigerants. And you need to know some basic electrical skills. What you do not need is you do not need to know about combustion, uh, either gas or oil uh, systems. You do not need to know about ducts and running ducts. You do not need to know uh, anything about brazing lines. Um, I want to put a little disclaimer in here, and, and, and Robert alluded to that in the introduction. I am not a mechanical engineer or a trained HVAC installer. I'm a building physicist. I've worked 25 years on the envelope of buildings, um, windows, heat transfer, and, and other building technologies. Uh, my experience with installing HVAC equipment is exactly uh, one mini split at my house. Um, I am EPA 608 certified, so I went through the certification training. Um, but I'm passionate about decarbonizing buildings. And based on my experience of, of installing this unit and going through the training and, and what was involved, I have some ideas about how we can do this faster uh, transition away from fossil fuels. So that's why I'm talking. This is me on, on the ladder here, running the line set through the, through the wall. Um, as we talk about refrigeration systems, I think it's important to, to have the, uh, the motto that's, that medical doctors use that is first, do no harm. And what I mean by that is we have to be very careful with handling refrigerants. Uh, we all know about the global warming potential of refrigerants. And if you were to install um, any heat pump or air conditioning system um, without the proper care, and you would lose refrigerant, now you have, yes, you are saving carbon by not running a furnace, but the, the leaking potential of this refrigerant and having to refill it is, is a huge impact on the environment. So you need to properly torque all the connections, not just use two wrenches and be like, yeah, it's about tight enough. Um, you need to use the proper low loss fittings and hose setup so you don't vent refrigerant out. Um, if you do a high quality insulation, that will last a long time. You can have a mini split that runs for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. If you do a poor, quick job, you don't really make a careful flare, you don't use the right tools, you don't do all the testing. Um, you could have a system that after a year, some of the refrigerant has leaked out, it's not working, the homeowner calls you back, you top it up, you maybe tighten something, and maybe two years later, it's empty again. So that's really important that we get high quality installations so we don't waste any of this refrigerant. We use the refrigerant for as long as possible in a well-installed system. So I think that refrigerant leakage can undo a lot of decarbonization benefits. So I wanna talk about the case for mini splits from a few different perspectives. I wanna start with the homeowner case. Um, one of the reasons that I think mini splits are great, ductless mini splits are great, is it gives the ultimate temperature control for, for rooms. Um, we're all familiar probably with zoned uh, systems where you might have a upstairs zone in your house and a downstairs, and um, you can control the temperature in both of these zones. When you have a, a ductless mini split, each unit you can set the temperature. So if you have one room or one area of your house where you have a ductless mini split, you can control the temperature there. You can have very high efficiency um, systems because these are small systems that are uh, sized right. Uh, you can have the the efficiency rating that you might know about the SEER rating, you can have something as high as SEER 33, the unit that, that I installed in my house. You have redundancy. Um, we talked a little bit about resilience yesterday in Ian Walker's talk. Um, if you have multiple mini splits in the house and one fails, you could still have other parts of your house that are comfortable. If you have one central system and you live in a cold climate and it fails in the winter, 
you could be needing to move to a hotel because it's just not safe to live in the, in the house. Um, and so with mini splits, because they're smaller unitary systems, you can have some redundancy. The outside units, um, outdoor units are much quieter. Um, we're all familiar with the outside compressors kicking in and making a bit of noise. And in densely populated areas, people are sometimes worried about installing air conditioning units. These ductless mini split outdoor units have a very, very low noise level. And you don't need to do any duct work. Um, I don't know on this picture here, if you can guess what happened here. This is a return, return duct in a ceiling. This is not my house. Um, and what happened here is the installer stepped through a ceiling um, and they didn't step on the, on the rafters, but accidentally um, probably lost their balance and stepped through the, the, the sheetrock off the ceiling. Um, the joke I've heard is there's two types of installers that work in, in attics, the ones who have stepped through ceilings and the ones who haven't stepped through ceilings yet. And there's some downside, of course, as with any system. Um, it, this is one room, one zone. So if you want to do a whole house, you need multiple of these. Um, there's aesthetics. Some people don't like the look of these wall-mounted units. And there can be some noise at the indoor units during defrost cycles. Um, now I want to talk about the installer case for ductless mini split heat pumps. Um, the first is that they're installed in conditioned space. So they're not installed in an attic, which can be very hot or very cold, depending on the season. And putting a system that is providing heating in a cold attic is inefficient. Providing a system that is providing cooling in a, uh, sorry, cooling in a hot attic is not efficient. Heating in a cold attic is not efficient. So these units are not installed in unconditioned space, what we call attics. Um, there's no duct work to run. There's no brazing, you know, with torches and, and potentially some fire hazard. And the weight is limited. And I just want to play this video clip here. This is from an installer who is replacing a coil in, a, in an attic for a four-ton heat pump. And he is working at bringing this unit up through the um, attic hatch. And at this point, he's already been at this for about a minute and a half. And I'll just play you a few seconds, a clip. That has got to come through. Take a little breather. So you, you, you get the sense there, and um, this is in the middle of it. He, he drops it a couple of times almost. Um, it's very hard work. It's very um, challenging work. So that was a non-ductless mini split. That was a central system with, with a, a big coil being replaced in the attic. And you saw it being banged around, and that cannot be good for the durability for this new unit. Um, and now I want to make the efficiency case for ductless mini split heat pumps because we're also, of course, very concerned with energy efficiency. Um, the good thing is you only heat or cool the rooms that are occupied. So if you have um, a house and you're in one or two rooms, you can heat or cool those rooms. And for example, during the night, you, you don't need to heat or cool the whole house. You can have very high efficiency. I mentioned SEER 33 are, are possible. They're installed in conditioned space. There is no electrical resistance backup heat. Um, yesterday, also in Ian Walker's talk, he talked about um, panel upgrades and expenses with um, when you add large electric loads. And in this case, um, there is no electric resistance backup heat for these small units. They're very efficient. Uh, they work down, some of them work down to minus five Fahrenheit with 100% capacity, and they even work down to minus 13 with. 70 to 80 percent efficiency so they don't need electric resistance backup heat and there's also reduced electrical demand uh, there's something called lra locked rotor amps that are important when you have a, a battery backup system for example if you want to have solar with a with a battery that provides backup um, that backup system can only provide a, a limited amount of power and if you have a big three-ton central ac unit 
that startup current, that locked rotor amp could be as high as 80 amps. With these small units, it's in the order of 10 amps. And even though you have multiple units, you don't have to assume that they all try to start up at the same time. So you, you could get away with a battery that can support 10 or 20 amps as opposed to 80 amps. And quickly talk about what are the steps to install one of these um, mini splits. And this is from some, uh, uh, this old house from their website. And so the first step is you, you install a plate on the wall. Second step is you drill a hole, you mount the unit and you hang it on the wall. The third step is, and I'll go in a little bit more detail later, but this is kind of the, the big steps through the whole process. You mount the outdoor unit, you run the refrigerant pipes, you cover them up in a nice little uh, line set cover so they, they're not as ugly on the side of the house. And then you do evacuation and or pressure testing first and evacuation and, and charging in the last step. Um, there are some manufacturer improve, improvements that I think are needed. Um, as we want to scale up these installs and make them faster and easier to install, there are a few things I, I ran across that I think can make the install faster and uh, less error prone. Uh, the first is risk of refrigerant line kinking. Um, here you see a, a copper refrigerant line that's coming through a brick wall. Here's the condensation line, here's the, uh, the liquid lines. And what you see here is a, is a kink. And it's very tricky to bend these pipes. If you wanna make a 90 degree turn and you don't do it carefully, you can kink the pipe. And now, since that pipe is attached to the indoor unit, you might have to send that one back to the manufacturer because you cannot, it's not easy to field repair this. Um, second thing I think we need is integrated diagnostics to see if there's a refrigerant loss. In case there is a leak, we want to know that that's happening before the homeowner says, hey, it's not cooling or heating well. Um, next, I think we need to um, make terminals, electrical terminals that accept stranded wire without needing to crimp lugs on this at my house. And you know, for those of you who've, who've landed wires on screws, this just takes a bunch of extra time of putting these lugs on and making sure that you have the right size for these screws. It could be much, much faster if the manufacturer changes this terminal. And then lastly, um, the mounting holes on these plates. Um, this manufacturer says these five locations, you put, should put screws into the wall to, to mount it. At my location, um, you know, my studs were 16 inches on center. So, I could put this screw into a stud and then none of the other ones would be in the stud. They would just be in drywall. Um, this 16 inch on center. So I drilled a hole here, measured it out, drilled a hole there and added a screw. It's not a big deal, but if you want to speed up installs and make it easy, having one extra hole there would make it a lot faster. And these units, um, these are units from an, a manufacturer from Japan, but they're actually made in Mexico. So they're targeted to the North American market. And I think it would be easy to modify this and make it a little bit quicker for installers to just have those, the, the right spacing. There's a lot of detail here about the installation steps. Um, I don't want to go through all of this. I'll, I'll jump through a few, but it's uh, a few aspects of it. This is also, if, if someone's really interested in doing this, they can see all the, all the steps here. But basically, you mount the indoor unit that you saw earlier. So you drill a hole, you mount the plate, you attach the cable, and you feed the refrigerant lines, and then you hang your indoor unit. And that's actually the fastest part of the whole process. I was surprised by that. What takes a lot of work is running the line set, these, these copper tubes from inside to outside. And um, in this case, we uh, need to do the, the cutting, the flaring. I won't get into the details. Uh, you mount the outdoor unit, make sure it's it's uh, level and attached. And then the important part is this pressure test where you make sure that there's no leaks in the system. So you put five or 600 PSI of nitrogen into, the, into your piping once you've made all the connections, and then you make sure that that pressure holds. And then you do an evacuation where you take all the air out and potentially moisture in the system. And you do that and make sure that there's no moisture left in the system, so it holds the vacuum, and then you release the refrigerant, which is pretty quick. Electrical, there's a four-conductor cable between in interior unit and outdoor unit. 
Um, you're required by code to have a disconnect switch near the unit. Um, it's good practice to put a surge protector on there because um, surges can damage these uh, the, the electronics in these units. You need to provide power, but it's not a lot. Um, some of these one ton units, that's like 12,000 BTUs, require a 15 amp, 240 volt circuit. Um, you can use standard electrical 14.2 Romex wire, which costs 75 cents per foot between your electrical panel and this disconnect switch. It's not very expensive electrical wiring. And then you need to have an outdoor unit nearby, um, a receptacle for servicing. Here's a list, I won't go through the details. Um, these, this is all the equipment that's required to do this install, equipment that I didn't have and most, I think, people that um, start this kind of work or you know, that technicians need to have. Um, I didn't put the price here. If you just start to guess, these are all the units. Um, what do you think this is all together? Um, it is $1,000 basically to buy all this equipment brand new. And this is like professional level equipment. I've put a whole list of tools on my website, decarbonize.homes, if you want to look at it. And you also have this, this PowerPoint through the Best Center. Um, I said it's easy to install. Um, not all installs are easy. Here's a, one I found online. It's a mini split indoor unit. Looks pretty easy. There's just some art hanging below it. But if you zoom out a little bit, you see that this unit was put on, above a stairwell. And it's not easy to work on uh, for maintenance if you want to clean the blower wheel. Fortunately, the homeowner had a ladder that worked in here, but the installer had only this kind of ladders and couldn't have worked safely on it. So it's not all easy. It's much easier than working in attics, but there can be challenges. Um, I do think there's some research that could be done to help speed this up. One thing is um, quick connect or press fittings that can be done. Instead of this um, flares and torquing, there's these um, quick connect press fittings that you can do. Uh, they're used a lot in potable water. They can also be used on refrigerant lines. But a lot of people are skeptical if they hold long term. There's quick connect fittings, uh, Mr. Cool systems that have these uh, with pre-charged lines. Again, there's not been as much uh, research about the long-term durability of these systems. I think we need integrated fault detection and diagnostics in these systems to detect refrigerant leakage. Um, I know Jessica Granderson will be giving a talk later today about some of these um, algorithms, not specifically to heat pumps, but that concept of detecting a fault within an equipment um, and not just, hey, it's not cooling or heating anymore. I think we could have some apps that guide a technician during vacuum testing, for example, to show is there a leak in the system or is there moisture in the system? There's some pretty easy analytics you can do based on vacuum um, level changes. And then it can be checklists to make sure you do proper installation. Like, have you done this? Have you done that? Uh, so in summary, I think uh, ductless mini splits can be installed with limited skills. Uh, the tools required are not that expensive for this specific uh, work. The uh, units can be very efficient. Um, and it should be possible to rapidly uh, increase the rate of installation of these heat pumps. And there is some um, work about durability that we, that we need to, to think about. Um, some resources, there's some excellent YouTube videos, uh, very detailed videos about how to install systems, um, explanation of HVAC components. There's a free training and exam to get this EPA 608 certification. So. With that, um, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. I'm happy to take those. Thank you, Christian. We've got a couple of minutes. So fire off any questions you have either in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I think there was one. Oh, there we go. So Alice asks, are all brands of mini splits created equal? Are there some which are more efficient or some which are more prone to break down? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's a big price range, like, like with anything. There's uh, you know, what people would consider A brands and, and B brands, just like if you're 
if you're thinking about buying a monitor for your for your computer you can get one of the known big brands or you can buy another brand um what i focused on was also performance in different climates um there's a uh, a great resource at nia the northeast energy alliance um, they have an air source heat pump um directory and you can look at manufacturers and you can see the performance at different temperature points so for example i installed this heat pump in new jersey where it does get uh, below zero fahrenheit occasionally and in early december it did get around five fahrenheit so what matters there is you want a heat pump that can uh, is like a cold climate heat pump that has performance at lower temperatures if you're installing one in california in the coastal climates that might be much less important so um i think performance is important one thing i didn't mention um i did self-install here i'm talking here about workforce development um trained technicians i did a self-install and the manufacturer will not give any warranty for self-installs um there are brands that are pre-charged do it yourself that will warranty a self-install um and so i took a risk i basically said well I, I won't have warranty but i think i can do a, a good quality install um so i think it's important to look at performance to do proper sizing get a system that works in in your climate look at the reviews as as with with, with anything both on the installer and on the equipment and there's definitely some brands that manufacturers will say or you know installs will say these are a quality brands we install these if you want to get a, a cheaper product that is a no name brand installed we won't do that because we won't be able to service it or get parts for it so fantastic we do have a couple of other questions but unfortunately we are out of time for right now um so christian if you have a few minutes to stick around after the next panel starts you could um throw answers to these in the chat if you have time and are willing. Sure, okay. happy to do that. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful questions. Um, I will turn it over to our next um, panelist and introducer or moderator. Um, Robert, I think we're going into the break. Oh, right, we do have a break right now. So um, in that case, if we, folks want to stick around, we could take a couple more minutes here with Christian to answer some of these questions. But that's up to Christian and you if you want to stick around. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy if you have any questions to read out. I, I don't have the chat. Sure, oh. not a problem. So Larry asks, is there a way to program time of operation? I know some occupants, occupants who run these 24-7, which totally defeats the energy efficiency savings. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. There are different levels of uh, programmability. I know for some systems, there is um, units that have a basic remote control that's on off and some timer. And then there's units that have kind of an advanced remote control that let you do more programming. Um, so there's and I think that advanced remote control can also be purchased. What's also happening is that there's now more sensors on these units that for example can detect occupancy and so it used to be if you set the thing to 70 degrees and you left for the day and it was heating or cooling it would just keep running now they can do automatic setbacks based on occupancy because they say well we can see you're not in a room so maybe we don't have to control it to to that temperature so and there's even some systems that try to detect the where the occupants are and direct the air to them. So to be a little bit more targeted, because another thing uh, is, do we always need to cool the whole room or do we just need to cool or heat a certain area of it? Um, UC Berkeley's done a lot of work about personal comfort systems where you're trying to heat or cool the person as opposed to the building. Um, and so some mini splits are starting to um, work into into that area so yes there's programmability there's um advanced thermostats there's also you know remote apps where you can say hey i want to turn it on 15 minutes before i get home um they've come a long way from the on offset one temperature products fantastic 
So um, Teresa also or asks, do you know of any analysis on the Mr. Cool brand and others that are meant for the DIY market, kind of those that are sold on uh, the Amazon? And also yeah. notes that if you don't have the ability, you can typically hire a plumber to do the nitrogen test so um, the rest can be done still DIY. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I I consider the, the Mr. Cool systems um, a couple of reasons I didn't go for them. One of them is I wasn't sure about their cold climate performance, and I I really wanted a heat pump that would work well at low temperatures, so I wouldn't have to switch to gas. Um, they do have some uh, models that work, but they're not quite as good as the real cold climate heat pumps. When, when I looked. Um, I do think it's very appealing. These systems, uh, you can buy them at some of the big box stores. You can just, you know, go there and pick up a box and, and connect it all together. What I do understand is that um, HVAC installers will not service them. If you say, hey, I have a Mr. Cool that's not working, I installed it myself, they'll say, yeah, we, we, we don't know how to work with these systems. We don't have all the service manuals, all the parts for them, so we can't really help you with that is what I've heard anecdotally. Um, I do think it's it's great in terms of having a HVAC installer do just a nitrogen testing. I consider that as well. But what I also understand is that if you if you are doing the piping, they say, well, we're not going to give you a warranty because if you only call us in for the last bit of work, we're basically warranting that you did all the work well, and we don't know how it was done. So if you just you know drill the holes in the wall, build the stand, do kind of the, the rough work, I think it's fine. If they do the whole piping and connections, that will work. So you can certainly kind of negotiate with them and say, hey, if I do this part, I buy it, I do this and this, will you do that? That can work. But if you say, hey, I've, I've connected everything, can you just come pressure test it, uh, evacuate it and sign the warranty card for me, they'll say, from what I understand, if you're lucky, they'll do it. But a lot of times they'll say, we don't want to take that risk. Makes sense. So I think this probably better be our last question. So everybody does get a chance for a break. Yes, um, yes of course. So there's been some discussion in the um, chat about thermostats and integration with, can you bring your own thermostat? Um, Teresa makes the comment, the thermostat question is a good one. I think Airflow and Sensibo provide some good connection options for smart thermostat integration. Would love to hear more. Um, do you have any particular knowledge? I know your unit was a Mitsubishi, um, but. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Um, being the, the researcher that I am, I have read that there's ways to actually connect into the indoor unit with like you know a raspberry pi and get all the status and the controls which i'm planning to do but i first wanted to go through a season and let it run before i completely um, take it apart so i don't know i know there's various thermostats by the manufacturer i know that it's not as simple as to say hey i have an ecobee or nest i want it to control my mini split i believe that is maybe with intermediate pieces uh, possible, but it's not a plug and play connection. But that's the level I'm happy to report back in you know a year or so of once I've looked into the innards of it, of, of what's possible. I think there's a lot of potential there for companies. And I think it's not unreasonable that a company like Nest or Ecobee would come out with a module that you plug into um, the mini splits as they become more popular and could do deep control, like smart control of them, but I'm not aware of it at the moment. The ones that I've seen that um, work with some sort of integration usually use an intermediary of some home automation type system um, and through an open API, um, but that's yeah. by far not all of them. Great. Fantastic. Thank you again for your time, Christian, and especially your extra time here answering these questions. Um, it's been a pleasure. Great. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. We will see you in the next session.